All right, welcome everybody to our panel discussions for today. First up, we have Natalie, who is going to be talking about women's education in Afghanistan. I'm Natalie Stratton. Just a little introduction. Um, I personally wanted to pick a topic on Afghanistan because I was there in 2011 to 2012. I worked directly with women as well as the locals, and I came out with a really fun experience with the culture, and I, I would love to work in the future to try and preserve the culture. Also, um, right now I'm getting my bachelor's degree in Middle Eastern Studies and Persian in general, so I have a lot of background in this stuff. So. Afghanistan has globally been studied by scholars regarding its past and current policies eradicating women's most basic human rights. In 2011, the Thomas Reuters Foundation ranked the war-ridden state as the most dangerous country in the world to be a woman. That study was conducted almost a decade after the collapse of the Taliban rule that had inflicted the female population with inhumane rulings, but yet the country maintains an exceptionally low literacy rate among both men and women even after their emancipation. The recently retired U.S. Secretary of State, Colin Powell, famously was quoted in 2001 that the rights of women in Afghanistan will not be negotiable. And yet, it seems that even a decade after the West ousted the Taliban government in Afghanistan, they have only just tapped into the recovery of women's rights within the new Afghan government. I propose in my evaluation concerning the Afghanistan war on education that by enlightening the female population within Afghanistan, they can rise against the Taliban and actively push out extremism within the country that currently is threatening to tear down all the progress that has been made since the fall of the Taliban government in 2001. The international goal should be to educate women of Afghanistan, which will result in the schooling of their children who have known nothing but war for several decades. The world must support these women in their fight for education if they want to see a lasting peace settle within Afghanistan. But first, to understand the mindset of the Afghan people, we must look at the history of women's educational reforms and their development through the vastly different governments. As far back as the 1920s, with the establishment of the modern school system within Afghanistan, there have been public schools for girls and women to attend. In the late 1920s, Afghanistan even sent its first female to study abroad for higher education. Amir Abdul Rahman Khan, from 19, 1880 to 1901, was the first Afghani ruler to set reforms in support of women's rights. These new rights included the encouragement of girls to attend school and emphasized marital rights for women. His grandson, Amun Ula Khan, as you can see on the right side photo, who ruled from 1919 to 1929, was famously quoted, tribal customs must not impose itself on the free will of the individual. His belief that Afghanistan's lack of women's human rights did not coincide with Islam, but it was a tribal beliefs that directly were overrunning government policies. Women's rights began to progress within the country, and in 1959, the first woman attended Kabul University as a student. With the introduction of the rise of the Socialist People's Democratic Party in 1978, Afghanistan soon found itself under direct Russian control. Under Marxist influence, educational reforms were drafted, giving women more freedom than ever before. Under the Afghanistan Socialist Constitution, the ASC, all subjects of Afghanistan were guaranteed the right to education, no matter what gender they were. Though education was not a forced action, more girls and women attended schools under the ASC in Afghan's history. The language used by the Socialist Party in their reforms, however beneficial it may have been to the educational field, isolated the rural and tribal majority within Afghanistan. This isolation led to a significant backlash in the population against the reforms including the educational movement, which led to widespread rejection of anything produced by the Soviet regime. This rejection of outside influence may be a key factor to consider when analyzing why the Taliban were so merciless in, den uh, in denying women their rights that they had been awarded during Soviet rule. The Soviet campaign in Afghanistan ended in 1989, leaving a power vacuum in the Persian state. From 1989 until 1996, the state was internally broken apart by numerous insurgent groups attempting to claim and run the country. But even in the chaos, educational benefits for women were still at a high. Half of the students enrolled in school were women, and they were able to make up a considerable amount of the Afghani workforce to include 70% of the teaching staff. In southern Afghanistan, a group of soldiers trained in Pakistani Islamic schools called themselves Taliban, 
or students, claimed to bring pure Islam to Afghanis and Muslims as a whole. In 1996, the Taliban movement overtook Kabul and established the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. Under Taliban rule, school attendance dropped to 6.4% of the entire population, in which girls were prohibited to, attend, to enroll in school after the age of eight entirely. Medical access was also restricted to women, and according to the United Nations, the life expectancy of the Afghani woman dropped to only 48 years old. Those who opposed the Taliban were met with brutal punishments and even sometimes resulting in the death of the female perpetrator. In these hostile conditions, conditions many educated women fled the country. The remaining who stayed behind opened secret schoolhouses or ran, began organizations attempting to unite and empower women from all over their neighborhoods. The Women's Muslim League, or the MWL, argues that the move made by the Taliban to restrict the education of the female population was a calculated and manipulative decision and not due to a more pure interpretation of Islam, as they had claimed. In order to maintain control over the population, the Taliban violated Islamic doctrines, giving women their right to education, in order to maintain control over their community. By not educating women, females would then be unable to recognize that their rights were being violated in the first place. By keeping the population unaware of their basic rights to education, the Taliban were able to strengthen their hold over women's and their families. The West began their war on terror by involving the fight for women's rights within Afghanistan in 2000. The United States argued the demand for equality under Taliban's rule as one of the main reasons for invading Afghanistan in 2001. In one of the first ever president's radio address, which was made by the First Lady Laura Bush, she was quoted, the fight against terrorism is also the fight for the rights and dignity of women. I argue that with education can come peace to the region and a lasting peace if Afghanistan's women are allowed to gain back their educational freedom. More than a decade after the overthrow of the extremist Taliban government within Afghanistan, the country still finds itself confused and passive in regards to educational benefits for women and their involvement in the country's future. Still in the rural areas of Afghanistan, where mullahs yield more control, more so than the president, current president Hamid Karzai, Girls and women are still denied entry to educational facilities. The fact that women are massively undereducated and illiterate within Afghanistan's provinces alludes the majority of women do not quite understand the great value of having an education, and many still are not fighting for that right. The more urban regions where women are attending school, the funding is so low that they are not, there are not enough textbooks and the majority of the students who graduate often cannot read the text, but instead memorize the section required. If women do gain an education, however, many are leaving the country to look for work outside Afghanistan's borders. Currently, Afghanistan is finding itself involved in a new age concept that its neighbor Iran is facing as well, the idea of brain drain. Decades before the power vacuum was left with the withdrawal of the Soviets from Afghanistan, many Afghanis received education in higher degrees. A couple have flourished with PhD professionals, like teachers, doctors, and entrepreneurs. Now, Afghanistan finds itself in political and financial instability and cannot reacquire back their educated masses. In most schoolhouses in Afghanistan, only two out of 20 teachers have even graduated high school. More often than not, women find themselves graduating with degrees in Farsi or education and they choose to leave for better opportunities in Turkey or Europe instead of staying in their country. Despite these grim outlooks, however, women have made leaps and bounds in progress since the detainment in 1996. Women played a massive hand in the creation of Afghanistan's current constitution. Article 22 states that all citizens of Afghanistan, whether man nor woman, or women, have equal rights and duties before the law. The, this article grants women their rights back to an equal, to an education equal to that of men. In the constitution as well, the government has issued a gender quota system for political nominees. This quota guarantees that 27% of the representative assembly must be women, and that 50% of presidential nominees for the upper house, or the Mastrana Joga, must be women as well. Currently, Afghanistan has more women holding positions in their parliament than the United States has in all their political systems combined. In order for the education of women to have an effect on the future of Afghanistan, funding must be taken seriously, and their education cannot be negotiated away. Currently, many schoolhouses do not have enough funds to have even outdoor, indoor classrooms. Many students find themselves sitting below trees or in tattered tents, passing around one textbook for 30 students to share. There are still not enough female teachers at each schoolhouse as well. 
And many tribes do not feel comfortable that their daughters being taught by male teachers. And many girls are not allowed to finish school. From a study conducted by CNN in 2012, there had been an estimated 185 undocumented attacks on schoolhouses in Afghanistan just in 2012 alone. Female students have been attacked by extremists with poison or acid, and even some girls have been, have been killed leaving school. The drastic measures taken by extremists in Afghanistan must be taken with equally drastic measures by the Afghan government to protect and fund the educational buildings and its students in the country. If Afghanistan and the international community want a peaceful future within sight, education and the education of women is the only key to that factor. Gulham Hazrat Tanha, who is the Director of Education in Herat Province, has stated, If women are educated, that means their children will be too. If the people of the world want to solve the hard problems in Afghanistan, i.e. kidnappings, beheadings, crime, and even Al-Qaeda, they should invest in our education. There is a harmony among Islamic scholars that education is the responsibility of every citizen, man, or woman, and it is the right supported by the vital teachings of Islam. When the Taliban took that opportunity away from women just two decades ago, they removed a large chunk of Afghanistan's future. They also unknowingly had created an internal and international opposition that would rage war against them in order to restore their dignity and their rights as women. After granting three female rights activists the Nobel Peace Prize in 2011, the Norwegian Nobel Committee issued a set of international guidelines in order to help restore women's educational rights globally. They called for the international community to ensure that women are always allowed to be involved in any peace process now and in the future, and that women's educational rights are never to be negotiated away without the understanding that lasting peace cannot exist in that environment. They asked for the world to invest in female leaders and professionals that encourage the education and profitability of women. These guidelines force the global community to recognize the importance of women's education, and they ask for intervention in any situation that denies these rights. Education, educating and funding educational programs for women in Afghanistan is our only means available to empower the Afghan population to become more successful in fighting terrorism in their own country. If the international community truly hopes for a lasting peace in this war-torn country, they can only aid the current educational movement happening right now inside Afghanistan's borders. Women and girls alike must be given a fighting chance to take their future into their own hands by giving the same opportunities that women internationally have to an education. Any questions? Is this you? Yeah. Okay. Wow. <laughs> yes. Um, so what do you predict will happen next year when the U.S. pulls out of Afghanistan? I think that the Taliban's going to make a very calculated move to attempt to take back over the government. I think that if we can prepare its citizens to keep the Taliban and extremism out of their country, even if it's not the Taliban, it could be the Mujahideen. We need to prepare the citizens, and the women are the backbone of the family. If they're the educated, they can educate their children, and they can show their children that extremism isn't the way to follow up. If you have no money, you try to destroy them to be a soldier. So right now it's looking kind of grim, but hopefully if we can empower the people enough. Mm -hmm. Is Carla a I mean, does he care about this issue at all, women's education? Is he on board to have, you know, a, a minister for education in <coughs> Afghanistan? Like what, what does they, that look like? They do have a minister of education, actually, and Karzai is supportive in the public field. I'm not too certain how his personal feels are on it. He's taken picture with women who have graduated a couple of university. He's very open about it, but he's also, his, his government receives all the funding, and none of the funding is going to education, so... You can look at that, maybe how they kind of view education with women. Yes. Um, who do you think should fix all these problems? Um, because we, like, if we read the history, we find that um, it was the U.S. with Saudi Arabia and Pakistan who built, like, who made the Taliban and Mujahideen to fight against the Russians. You know. Yeah. So it was like for their interest. It was for Pakistan's interest. It was for Saudi Arabia's interest. It was for U.S. interest. But this country, it got like torn between all these, you know, like, different countries. So who do you think should be, like, uh, held responsible or should take the responsibility to, like, fix everything up again? I think internationally we should hold responsibility for what we've done to the country. It was a beautiful country and it had a great history and there was no reason why it should be in the state that it currently is. 
the way that we can fix it, I think that we need to put it into the hands of the Afghan people to fix their own state. We have done enough damage to it that I really feel that if they were given the proper tools, they could fix their own situation and have a really flourishing government. Okay. How much support is there for this initiative from, you know, first generation Afghan refugees around the world? There's actually a lot of different um, international communities that uh, Afghanis who have left Afghanistan that they are actually making fundraising for the education educational program within Afghanistan. I found a lot of them online actually. You can Google if you are interested in helping the educational programs within Afghanistan. But a lot of females who have left Afghanistan and find themselves in another country are actually helping with this movement. There's a huge movement right now internationally to help that. But if it can actually make it in Afghanistan it would be worthwhile to see.